Let me introduce uh, Alan Baumgartner from Ford Motor Company. Alan is a technical leader uh, for virtual manufacturing, computer, computer aided process engineering, and PLM. Uh, Ford's one of the most recognized brands. We have uh, about 166,000 people in uh, 78 plants all over the world. And uh, today I thought I'd give you a little culture insight into what's going on in some of those plants uh, from the foundation of the company some 109 years ago. I think we're in our 109th year. So, uh, so let's look inside the plant a little bit. and. Uh, when we were first founded, the early vehicles were built by small teams of people. And uh, of course, they were highly skilled, but it resulted in uh, low output and uh, kind of high costs for those uh, 1903 vehicles. And uh, amazingly, in just a very short period of time, in 10 years, uh, things completely changed. And Ford had a $5 a day offer, and just floods of people came in from uh, all over rural areas and everything. And so you see a mass of people there in front of the Highland Park plant. And uh, suddenly we had the moving assembly line and we had a high volume. But something happened to the way we treated the, the plant floor worker. They became unskilled and uh, just a lots of them, right? And then uh, the next evolution in uh, automotive manufacturing, I'd say, is in plants like the Rouge plant, which was a huge uh, logistical accomplishment in terms of uh, just getting all of the parts there in the, in the Rouge plant in, in Dearborn, Michigan, took in raw materials. Uh, Henry Ford had uh, his own uh, uh, ore ships, and so we took in iron ore, coke, limestone. We had forests that we brought wood in from, and uh, Everything was at the Rouge plant, from making glass to tires. So, you know, ore on one side and vehicles rolling out the other side. Um, at its peak, uh, the Rouge plant itself employed 100,000 people. And keep in mind that today, Ford Motor Company globally is 166,000, right? That's a lot of people employed um, there. And uh, so, great for the booming automotive industry. And then uh, bad things started to happen. So uh, I pick here this example of the uh, oil crisis back in the 70s, which was a real wake-up call for uh, reducing costs and uh, producing vehicles that were uh, right for the market, not just because we had 100,000 people that could produce vehicles. And uh, so a number of different initiatives got involved. A lot of them had to do with trying to get efficient and reducing the workforce. And uh, as was pointed out this morning, we've reduced and reduced and reduced, and now we're down to the no more flesh left. It's just bone and sinew here. Um, in terms of the physical plants today, they're much better off. The Rouge today has got a, literally a green roof. There's a plant on it called sedum that absorbs water and reduces uh, energy and there's a lot more light and it's a much friendlier environment than what you might have seen in those old black and white movies. And uh, so the physical aspects and the efficiency of running the plant, energy and everything is uh, wonderful. But you know, is there something that we can do beyond the physical plant? And that's a little bit what I want to address today is these cultural issues. In terms of our products these days, we have four main areas we want to focus on, which are uh, really have to do with quality products, green, safe, and smart. And those same attributes that you would expect in a vehicle that would make a vehicle attractive are really the same attributes that we would want in the assembly plant itself, that it's producing quality, that it's green, that it's safe for workers, and that we're doing things smartly, right? That the workers share the same objectives as as the management. So uh, let me give a little schematic of a day in the life of some worker on an on assembly line here, a fictitious assembly line. So a couple of uh, operations and the workers adding some value on operation 10. And uh, we have a final test station at the end. The reason why we have a final test station is because we don't want to ship poor quality to the customer. And that's great. We prevent poor quality from escaping the assembly plant. But there's an expense to that. At a high volume mass production line, even a very small percentage, like 3% of a $1,000 part, 
you know, is uh, suddenly 15 million, right? Escaping the, or going through that, uh, failing the final test stand. Now we know we don't throw away everything just because it fails final test. You have some rework, so you can put some of that value back in the chain and, and uh, ship it after it uh, meets the quality standards, but there is some scrap. And everybody knows all these little hidden factories from Six Sigma training, that's a bad idea. So we need to bring in some Six Sigma expert so he can mine the MES data, try to figure out some root cause, try to figure out some reason why we can uh, reduce these failures in the final test area. And then this uh, expert from the engineering office has to consult with the plant worker who probably knows better how to fix the problem anyway. But um, he says, no, I don't think so. And then you go back and we have another little iteration there. And finally, uh, they agree and the plant floor guy makes some adjustment and hopefully uh, things got better. Now that's a scenario, typical sort of problem solving scenario. And in the end, we, yeah, we reduced some scrap. But in the meantime, while all of that conversation is going on, we've been producing scrap. So that's a bad thing. Now, what can we do uh, to eliminate this kind of time-consuming effort that uh, these Six Sigma processes tend to employ? Well, when you look at the overall problem, there's two things that really stand out. One, all the information that the plant floor guy in the end needed is somehow flowing away from him and not very visible to him. They're going into some mysterious databases on some servers in some air-conditioned room somewhere. Uh, second problem is that even for the expert, the Six Sigma data mining expert, uh, it's hard to sort out the important information from the sea of all the other stuff. It's obscured in, in all this other data that's there. So uh, what you'd really like, if it was possible, to eliminate all this confusion and conversation and iterations would be a much more simpler way to have some kind of a filter on your MES data, filters out the right stuff, and sends it right to the plant floor worker uh, even before the defects are produced so that he can see there's something trending in a bad direction, that he can adjust it and uh, not produce any, any defects at all. And that might sound like a, kind of a pie in the sky, oversimplified version, but that's kind of the promise of what this software called Reveal uh, is. And um, that was brought to my attention, and we wanted to do an experiment to see whether or not um, that's true, so uh, that that could really be done. Now, it's a little bit risky to implement uh, a whole new analytic system and everything in the production line, so we tried something uh, different, and maybe it's something uh, some of you guys might be, might be able to try if you, if you have some questions about how well some of those tools might work. Um, what we did is we created a virtual model of, a, of our existing plant and we wanted to see whether we could uh, utilize the data that we're already collecting today to see how effective that would be in doing problem solving and we also wanted to demonstrate uh, the ability uh, to detect variation and whether or not we could have seen it early variation that's even within the spec but variation that when added up or over time uh, contributes to a product failing uh, final test situation. So those were our kind of our two objectives. And what we did is we took our, um, our data and in our current databases, we analyzed that schema and we made, like I said, a virtual plant. So we synchronized uh, the way you would imp implement reveal to, your, to the plant floor system, but we made it uh, completely offline. And then we took a bunch of data that we had uh, backed up from our online systems, and we just streamed that to this virtual plant. So as far as the reveal software is concerned, it didn't know the difference whether or not it was really historical data or whether it was real-time data. So um, from that, we could watch what reveal was doing, what re when reveal was uh, detecting things, sending alerts, and, and so forth. So our objective then was to analyze whether reveal could do all of these nice things about real-time reporting and monitoring and that kind of thing. So, um, so that's what we did, and uh, uh, we we're pretty successful, actually. I'm pretty happy with the results of that. So we have some examples here. Um, some of the charts aren't uh, actual Ford data because uh, I wanted to keep that to myself. <laughs> but uh, for um, 
uh, for illustrative purposes, um, they're in line with uh, the kinds of things that we saw. So for instance, over a 30-day period, uh, we set up a, a simulated uh, number of workers, uh, 14 different people that we said were on the section of the line we modeled, and um, we had 37 monitors of things that we thought were interesting, should be that those workers might be interested in, different people, and uh, over the 30-day period, 156 alerts were sent out, which maybe sounds a lot, but in reality, you know, on average, that's only one alert every 2.7 days for uh, any one of those persons. So that's pretty manageable. Um, there's a number of things in the software that help keep those alerts manageable. But you can see in the chart there, the X bar R chart, that the kinds of things that would be brought to somebody's attention. So uh, obviously a process is running along nicely, and then something happens, and we start seeing some fluctuations. And it's important to say that those red lines there, those limits, are something that the operators can set in. Those aren't control limits or spec limits that cause the product to fail. It's just that the operator would like to know if this machine's performance wanders this far away from, from normal. Then let me know, and I'll take some uh, corrective action. Because uh, at this point, now that you've told me that, I can make some adjustment, but still every part is in spec, everything still assembles into a, a working component. Uh, however, sometimes there are test failures. So there's another type of chart here that shows um, here's a, a percent rejects from a test station. So you can look at that. And, I, and, and if you were on the plant floor, you would get an alert at the first peak past above the red line. But I wanted to show this. Um, this uh, particular chart because it illustrates another point that if something is running, uh, uh, if you've been alerted, you were alerted at the first point, and then things continue to run a little bit uh, out of control, then uh, you're not going to continually be hounded with alerts for the same reason. So it assumes, okay, you know something's going on and it's taking you some time to, to fix it. Uh, in some cases, there are machines which uh, the plan chooses to run if it's, uh, uh, let's say, falsely rejecting parts because there's a sensor bad on the machine just to uh, continue utilizing that resource uh, even though it's at a percentage of its capacity. Another kind of chart is maybe interesting. Hopefully you never see this in reality, but, uh, but this is some data that's showing we have a very capable process, very narrow, very capable process, except it's the mean of the process is above the limits that uh, you would expect. So um, again, in real time, you would, if you were monitoring this asset, you would get this notice ahead of time. If you chose not to do anything about that machine, then it would continue to run and, and produce, uh, uh, you know, parts uh, that are potentially out of spec for, uh, you know, for a long period of time. But you'd get a notification of that. What's interesting in these kinds of uh, simple to use charts like CPK is that in actual um, plant, those kinds of tests for calculating CPK are not normally done on a very regular basis, let alone real time that something has shifted. So it's maybe once a year you do some kind of qualification on your equipment. So uh, it's really insightful for people to see these kinds of things. If you have parallel machines and one machine is exhibiting this behavior and not the other ones, then you can immediately decide or know that uh, there's a problem with the machine as opposed to a problem with a lot of parts or something like that. So it's a number of quick decisions you can make. Oops, I hit the wrong button, sorry. Another uh, useful thing that you might want to know is how to prioritize your work. So you can uh, look at uh, what are the worst performing stations in terms of rejects, look at those things, and start uh, narrowing down where you want things to go. When we show these kinds of charts to the quality manager, um, some of the big top ones, the first bars, um, yeah, the plant knew about that. We know there's problems with this station. But uh, where there are some ahas is we didn't realize there was uh, this many problems, you know, with the second, third, and fourth stations, right? We ought to put a little bit of effort on that to, to uh, reduce those issues. Um, 
Another thing that's really interesting is the ability to uh, correlate or auto-regress to, to be able to take a problem, a failure mode, and try to compare that failure mode with things going on upstream, earlier in the value stream, so that you can quickly compare all the upstream variables that you have data for against failures and see whether or not there's something uh, up ahead that can be done, something that can either be detected and corrected or something that can become a predictor of, uh, of a failure in the future that you would want to put a monitor on, for instance. And um, that's pretty powerful and one of the reasons why it's important is that kind of correlation might be something you would expect from one of these Six Sigma analysis kinds of activities, but those activities take a long time. They sometimes take weeks to discover the root causes and get to that bottom line. And since you can auto-regress all the variables and reveal, you can get that kind of data in a very short period of time, maybe minutes to do that regression in real time um, that we saw on the chart before, just previously. And of course, there are some dashboards uh, as well. Um, the main point of these dashboards, I think, the cost of poor quality, is not that it's a financial tool that you're going to go to your financial department in the company and he's going to agree dollar per dollar this is exactly how much loss was occurred. The point is, is that you can uh, lay out what the value stream is. You can assign value along the way and between plant management and workers they have some kind of metric that they know reducing cost of poor quality is always a good thing. Maybe, maybe it's not exactly you know a thousand dollars, maybe it's something else, but it's always heading in the right direction and you're giving somebody on the plant floor some information that they can respond to and do something about and know that they're helping the company as opposed to today uh, or before such systems, the, the plant floor workers are, you know, in the dark, following directions that somebody told them, change this, change that. They don't know why, but okay, they'll, they'll do what they're told kind of thing. So uh, one of the things we wanted to kind of emphasize is this is really a problem solving tool. It's for immediate access. It's for pumping that data uh, when things start to go wrong, pumping it right to the plant floor person, making it visible. That's not the same exactly as an SPC package, although a lot of the charts might look like charts that you would see from an SPC thing. They're generated real time, so the idea is to be proactive about resolving those problems. And it's a way to resolve that problem and get the information you might get from an SPC package without having to do all the manual work of doing data mining. Um, <clears throat> So the clear goal, the clear business goal in these kind of focus is to prevent defects, right? And um, what's nice about this contained little kind of analytics uh, exercise is that management and everybody gets it. It's not like I'm going to spend a ton of money to implement some generic system that calculates interesting stuff for somebody to make good decisions sometime. It's, uh, we can reduce the number of scrap parts in this plant right now. That's hard dollar savings. That's something that management can get behind, right? So um, I think that's, uh, uh, as was pointed out in the this morning session, this having a, a clear business focus uh, is essential, right? So that's why we're focusing on, on first time yield and maximizing the benefits. Although we did it for, uh, for an assembly operation, I think there's broad applicability to any kind of high volume manufacturing. I think variation is uh, always the enemy for mass production things. So anything you can do to look at that, I think is helpful. Um, I think changing the paradigm from reactive to being proactive is, uh, is easy to say in PowerPoint presentations and it's easy to, to, to talk about in some kind of, of um, forum like this, it's uh, less easy to get the culture to change. So uh, I wanted to list a couple of those things. There's many tools that are around that compile data. We've had those tools for a long time. A lot of, like Sid said, some of the analytics tools, maybe we didn't call them analytics back then, we probably called them 
expert systems or something, I don't know, E this or I that or whatever we had. We have all these tools that can produce wonderful graphs as long as you know the six different login passwords and all the secrets of how to select things and run the reports. And um, if you're good enough at doing that, then you can generate the sanitized reports that are acceptable to give to management. You know? So what we want to do is kind of avoid that and just say, here's what's really happening on the plant floor. And slightly different to what, what Sid put, I wouldn't put the management at the center of the organization. It's the plant floor people that are producing the value-added components that should be at the center. And they can deal with the truth. Management gets excited when they see a little red dot above a red line or something, but the truth needs to be given to the people that are working on the plant floor. And that is a trust issue that, uh, at least in Ford, like I said, we're in our 109th year, and as I showed you, in the first 10 to 25 years, we developed this culture of, uh, of uh, stratification between management and the plant floor worker. And that's going to take some effort uh, to overcome that, to trust that, to bring those people into the problem-solving process. But uh, if you think about it, those guys that are on the plant floor, just like uh, maybe somebody who doesn't have a, 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 you know, barely graduated from high school is working in the, the auto body shop or, or some mechanic shop, the guy with the greasy hands, he really knows how to fix your car and what's going on wrong. It's not that you can uh, read a manual or talk to some engineer. The same thing is true here. There's a body of people on the plant floor that can really help and I think are willing to help if they're given the opportunity and the culture to bring them into the problem solving um, process. Maybe not everybody, but there is a rich number of people that are there that could be used. So. Um, Increasingly, because we've cut the workforce down, 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 down to the, to the bones and sinew, um, you can think now that the workforce is looking a lot more like that original 1903 picture, except the skilled teams aren't skilled with a hammer and forming sheet metal or machining parts. They're now skilled at running uh, the automation that does all those things, people that run processes. There's, there's a, Many places and times I can go into, for instance, our transmission plant, and you can do a 360 and, and not see a single person. Lots of equipment moving around and so forth, but not a single person, right? There's small teams of six people that are running on a shift a, a whole section of a line. Um, and it's, uh, it's that kind of... Uh, of world that, we, uh, that we've, we're finding ourselves in. So I think these problem solving teams uh, need to include the plant floor. So thanks for listening and uh, you know, we'll take questions during the, the panel period. And uh, I guess- Thank you, Alan. We'll do that. <laughs>